welcome to the Draft Deeper podcast. This is your host, Nathan Grubel. Joining me as always is my producer, Kevin Black, my co-host, Stephen Gillespie, and joining us for a very special episode of this Sir. podcast. We said that we were going to keep the guests rolling all the way through till draft time, and we weren't kidding. Um, this guest is somebody who I've been following his work all year, and he's done an incredible job covering what we wanted to talk about tonight. Somebody who, if you haven't read any of his work um, at Zag's blog on the Overtime Elite, please go ahead and do so. He's written a whole bunch of stories. He got plenty of time between now and the draft to brush up on some of his writing and get to know a little bit more about the program and its players. But we're going to jump in and talk about some of that tonight. Jacob Polashek. Jacob, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing great. Thank you guys for having me on. Yes, Absolutely. sir. Happy to have you. Yeah, it, it's our pleasure because, Jacob, as, as I've kind of said to you offline on social media, you, you and I going back and forth a little bit, this overtime elite experiment has been interesting, to say the least. I think <laughs> the, the outside perception is that a lot of people have mixed opinions. They don't necessarily know what to make of it, not necessarily as a program, right? Like, I don't, I don't think anybody thinks that overtime elites done a bad job of what they've built. Quite frankly, what they've built is incredible. Um, and I haven't gotten to see the facilities and everything firsthand, but you have. So I'm sure you're going to touch on some of those as positives for a little bit. But I think the evaluation is, is a different question. Um, it's, it's primarily high school level competition. And we're trying to evaluate some of the prospects. We're going to talk about Montero. We're going to talk about Barlow um, and possibly get into a few other guys between this draft and then the next draft. But really, it's about how do we translate that evaluation from what they're doing now and kind of going up like a level and a half or possibly even two levels all the way up to the NBA. That's going to be a little bit difficult for scouts to gauge. And it reminds me of the G league ignite situation when the ignite program first started, not quite the same thing because they're technically still playing against other professionals, but very similar in terms of nobody quite knew how much stock to take into the games, right? Nobody knew how to evaluate it in the best way. Then you get a year under our belts with Jalen Green, Jonathan Kaminga. You see some of these guys having the success they are already in the NBA. We're hoping for that same level of success with some of these overtime elite prospects. But Jacob, just kind of your, your big picture takeaways on overtime elite year one as a whole, your positives, your negatives. What are some of the things you, you love? What are some of the things, you know, may, maybe we just need to be educated on better from the outside? Yeah, just to start it off, the facilities are incredible. Um, I was blown away by the facilities. They have a regular playing court. Then they got a, a giant practice gym, um, two, two courts next to each other. And the, the, the facilities are just state of the art. Um, and that's just a major selling point. Um, and then you talk about the, uh, the there's also the, the coaches. You have some first class coaches with uh, it being led by Kevin Ollie, former national championship with mm-hmm. former national champion with UConn, um, Dave Lato. You've got um, Tim Fanning, a former G League coach, um, and then Ryan Gomes. A, he was a G League coach um, and obviously played in the NBA for some time. So the coaching staff is is really great. And then there's the the competition. Um, that's really been the biggest question mark. And I think if you would have asked me yesterday. Um, I would have had a very different answer, but now with this Nas Cunningham news, which we can get into later, um, it really changes things. Cause I think that when you're looking at it as, as they were this year competing with G league ignite and other college programs, it's a lot harder of a sell um, to get guys to come to overtime elite. Obviously the hundred thousand dollar salary um, mm-hmm. and NIL opportunities are great, but um, it's just hard to sell guys when they lose their college eligibility. Um, now, with if, if you see more guys follow suit of Nas Cunningham, and for those of you who don't know, he's not going to be taking that $100,000 salary. He's only going to be profiting off of NIL opportunities and therefore maintaining his college eligibility. Then that changes the whole game because yeah. they're competing with, I guess you could say, the Montverds, the Oak Hills, as a as Brandon Williams, the uh, executive re- vice president, said, he wants them to be he wants overtime elite to be the best finishing school in the world. And so, yeah. what this could be is the best option for guys to go before college, train, get ready, and then go to um, 
an NCAA program. Obviously, there's only one. We've only seen one guy do it today, and uh, we, we're, it's yet to be seen what's going to happen. And you're still going to have guys go there and go straight to the draft. Um, but today's news definitely um, is a game changer. It, it is. And it's, it's, it's funny. It happens on the day that we had already planned to record this podcast. It's like God is smiling upon us for, <laughs> for, for a quick second with that little news drop, but that is Jacob. I'm glad you, you did touch on it. You and I were messaging about it that we wanted to definitely hit on it on the podcast. Cause it is a big deal. Um, the fact that what this says to me is that overtime elite sees more of their competition with more of these, these preparatory academies and some of these sprout up schools that you see across the country that's really what they're viewing as a competition. They're not trying to compete as a pathway necessarily with, with G League Ignite, although they do offer some of the same flexibility immediately after high school. They could play for that year and then be eligible for the draft. But it, it is a game changer because you talked about all the money they've invested in facilities. Um, a big thing that I heard from the, the head of overtime elite, uh, head of overtime when he was talking about the elite program was they wanted to prioritize education. Like these kids are in small classes. They're, they're getting the education that they need along with it. So if you're telling me that they can sell parents on not just the fact that they're going to be training like pros for the majority of the week, they're also going to be learning and absorbing knowledge and getting themselves ready for the college level or wherever, wherever life takes them after that, along with it, it's hard to turn down an opportunity like that, whether they're getting paid or not. If they do still want to go to college, they'll have the, the option to, to do so. Any any other thoughts really to throw in Jacob about like some of the other parts to it, like, like the education, like, did you get any like feedback from any players, like how classes are like, or any of like the, the quote unquote off court life? Like how are these guys enjoying being there in Atlanta? The guys enjoy it. And the thing that they really talk about is the ability to just be in the gym constantly. Yep. Um, it's really just, they have some classes during the day and then they're in the gym and that's basically all they do. Um, and so when you have those facilities, you can't blame them for wanting to be in there all the time. Um, but it's really, um, it's really just focused on basketball. Um, and so I think that that's why you're going to see a lot of guys, if they can go there and maintain their college eligibility, I think you're going to see a lot more high profile prospects choose this. Yeah. Route. It's like, it's like a college environment, right? Like more, definitely more so than high school. Like that's the feel that you probably get when you're there at overtime lead. And again, I, I really wish I was able to get down there, but that's why we needed to have somebody on the podcast who actually saw all this up close and personal to talk about these guys. Steven, I think, I think you had a few questions. You and I are going to tag team this interview a little bit. Go right ahead. Oh yeah, for sure. Jacob, I, I hope you're ready to get it from both ends, man, because I mean, <laughs> having someone that's so plugged in to the OT, you know, we're going to pepper you with a little bit of questions, but by all accounts, you know, you're a professional. I'm sure you're going to be able to handle this, but I'm going to fire away with one question in that the OTE just kind of, you know, it started up, obviously didn't spring up out of the ground overnight. Like there was a lot of planning and foresight. And I think OTE is capitalizing on the fact that we see a player in the G League right now, you know, Jan Montero, who did take like an unconventional route, right? He tried to do the Chameleon BX. That didn't work out. And now he had to. Marjan? I'm sorry, Marjan Bochamp. Yes. Yeah. Is that is that what I said? You said, you John. said I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you for correcting me. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm looking at a piece of paper and talking at the same time. Excuse me there. So Marjan Bochamp went uh, to Chameleon BX, took an unconventional route. Now he's in the G League and, and doing well for himself. But I think that some players could look at a situation like that and be scared and kind of go the conventional route. But the OTE comes out now and they're having a successful first year and players are are – willing to take that risk and that chance and go to that are there any plans on like how they're preparing for year two that you're kind of privy to yet because I feel like year one for any sort of program is a learning experience right so have you been privy to any sort of uh, potential changes or anything like that that we can expect to see in year two well it sounds like they do want to stick with this 26 man roster um, it doesn't sound like in the near future they have their sights set on really expanding too much, but they really want to hone in on the 26 guys. Um, I know that they really want to prioritize international recruiting, um, bringing in guys from overseas, which they did uh, pretty well this year. Mm -hmm. um, I know that they're going to increase that, really trying to push to bring in some top overseas talent. 
Um, that that's really uh, in my conversations with Brandon Williams, the executive vice president. That was really something that he prioritized was the international recruiting. Excellent. And then, you know, obviously as scouts, right, like Nathan and I were, you know, talent evaluators were projecting to see where these guys are going to potentially go in the draft and things like that. I feel like a lot of people last season with the G League, you know, it was different. It was new. It was different than college and OTE, obviously, in its inaugural season, we're seeing a lot of the same things, right? It's obviously a different feel and a different level of competition, you know, even amongst some other high school competition, right? So do you think that the the level of play, how we evaluate that as, as scouts, do you think that the feedback that people have been giving on that has been fair whenever we're watching these guys prepare to, to make that jump to the NBA? I think so. I think obviously it depends on who's giving the feedback. Um, sure. Yeah. Who's, who's actually going and, and watching either the games on YouTube or, or in person. Um, I think that I personally, I get a much better idea of who these guys are as players and how they project as pros when they do their interleague games. Um, Cause obviously for those who don't know, the, the league is split up into three teams, team elite, team overtime and team OTE. And while each of these teams will go and play uh, high school programs, you really get the best idea of how these guys project as pros when they're playing each other. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's, those are the games when I really have my eyes glued to the court and, and seeing how guys are performing. Um, and so I know that the league does get a lot of criticism on the competition um, and rightfully so when you're not going to get a great idea when these guys are beating a high school team by 40 points, but, uh, when they do play each other, the, the games are intense and you get a much better idea of how these guys project. And one more question I have before I turn it right back over to Nathan, I think that another critique that I have seen from those who I've, I think do have criticisms of, of the league is the actual gameplay, right? Like you hear very much so that it's an AAU style of play do you have do you have any sort of information on what like the coaches are emphasizing on on developing these players it's a lot of individualized training um these guys the, the coaches are preparing these guys to become professionals to go to the nba to play professionally overseas and so you see a lot of that individualized training which may translate to a lot of guys wanting to play um their own game without really combining together and and seeing great team ball. Um, and so when I'm evaluating, I'm looking less at uh, how these teams are playing and more how individual players are playing and um, how they're improving their games. So let's, let's talk about some of the individuals then. Let's use this as an excellent segue. So um, I, I think we originally, I wanted to start with John Montero, but I'm actually a little more curious to talk about Dominic Barlow with you yeah. Jacob and listen I this is really funny I put out a tweet on social media I think it was like two or three weeks ago and somebody was asking me about my thoughts on Dominic Barlow somebody who had him as like a potential first round talent and I have him more in like that that second round mix right now and I specifically said on the tweet I've seen some good things on film and again it's all film I haven't seen Dom play in person uh, but there was nothing that really blew me away from the film, right? Like I saw a lot of solid plays. He can hit an open jump shot. He can rebound. He's a transition threat. I think he's grown. Has he grown to 6'10"? Is that report true? Yeah, he's he's, he's probably now at 6'10", I'd say. Okay, because last I knew in terms of reported height, he was 6'8", but then I saw this, right. that he had reportedly that's grown. So than six, eight. I, that, I would say six, that, ten, legit. Yeah, that two inches is that, – that actually does mean a lot when we're talking about his position potentially in the NBA – um, but that being said, I'm going off of majority, the, the overtime elite tape. I got to watch a little bit of his stuff, um, from before the OT program that was on Instat, but not working with a ton of film. And it's very similar to when I was trying to evaluate Shane Sharp, you know, that with not a ton of film to go off of at a certain level of competition, there are things you can miss about a player's game, especially when you're not seeing them in person. So I want your evaluation, Jacob, on Dominic Barlow, kind of like, who he was coming into the overtime elite program, what you thought he could do at the start, and then really how he grew as a player through over, over the course of the season and where you think he's at right now heading into the NBA draft waters. Yeah, so really starting 
from sophomore year of high school, um, coming out of Dumont, New Jersey, he was really, re- he was basically completely unknown, um, mm-hmm. unknown prospect. Then junior year came around, he, uh, start, he jumped into the starting lineup and, um, he had a great junior season, averaging 23 points a game, 12 rebounds. Um, and, and that's really when, uh, heading into that spring, he started to gain some traction. Then peach jam was when he really started to blow up per se. Um, you had a lot of schools coming after him. Um, and I think that personally, I believe that if he would have waited a little longer, you would have started to see the blue bloods come after him and, and some of the, some of the real top schools in the country. Um, but when he joined overtime elite, um, he was one of the more um, polished players, obviously being one of the older guys, being in that 2022 draft class, um, he has a leg up uh, in terms of his development, but I was, I don't think I was more impressed by a prospect all season. Wow. Okay. Besides the Thompsons. The Thompsons are just they're on their whole. Sure. They're, we'll talk about them a little bit at the end. Yeah, there, the there's end. a lot to like about them for sure. Yeah. Outside of the Thompsons, I was just continually impressed by Barlow. The, the big thing with him was every single game, he came out of the gates and started each game very strong. I was just impressed by the intensity that he showed at the tip of every game. Um, and he really started to hone in on his three-point shooting Um, not a knockdown shooter from three, but he's a, for someone his size, um, and his position, he's a very, um, he's a, he can shoot the three. Um, Mm -hmm. and I, I, you could see him throughout the season really looking to get his shot out there and looking to shoot those in the game. He he was never really shying away, um, from shooting the deep ball. Um, but his, his best, his best play is in transition, just don't go into the hoop. And he has a really strong mid mid range shot, so um, he really has a a very I would I would say unique game for someone his size. Um, and I think that I know that he's projected latest ESPN had him late second round. Um, I would take him early second, maybe even late first if you wanted to take a flyer okay. on. Okay. Um, I really see him as a very high floor I, I i see him being a very good nba player um it's just a matter of how high that ceiling is and, and just before steven hops in here by the way it is important to read off their stats and thankfully over time elite did provide their full season stats if you go on their website you can find any breakdown you want traditional counting stats they got per 36 per 40 advanced stats they got everything you need i'll just read off some of his per 36 numbers really quick 21.2 points per game rebounds, 2.1 assists, 58.5% on twos, 33.9% on threes. Good number there that backs up what Jacob was saying about his Mm three-point shot. 76% from the line, another number you would like to see from somebody projecting as a shooter. 3.2 combined steals and blocks for 36 minutes. That's also a really good number. Somebody who's active on the defensive end and a 108.1 offensive rating to an 82.2 defensive rating. So we can talk about some of the competition, which we already did, but at the same time, it's not like somebody like Dominic Barlow or John Montero. It's not like these guys aren't coming into this new league and, and not producing, right? They are putting up really good numbers um, against, against a pretty fair level of competition before they ultimately go into the NBA draft. So that was important to note, but that's really fun to hear that, that you are that in on, on, on Dominic Barlow. I, I love it. Go ahead, Steven. Yeah. So, you know, Jacob, you spoke to that, Barlow kind of came out of unware or out of nowhere, I believe you said as an unknown. And I feel like Nathan and I both echo that same sentiment coming into the same season. Going back and and look at and looking at where he was recruited to go, I believe one of the top schools that actually made him an offer was Pittsburgh, which some NBA players have gone through there. So I mean, it's no small potatoes that a program like Pittsburgh was interested in potentially bringing him on to their roster, right? So obviously he lands at o- OTE. And like you said, in the games that I've watched, he does start strong, you know, and I'm very, I'm very tantalized by his defensive potential because he has a a good knack for kind of timing those chase down blocks, playing passing lanes. Um, When he's locked in on that side, I feel like he can make a difference there. But the fact that he wasn't as high a priority in recruiting as some of these other prospects that are going to be going into this draft, 
I feel like that speaks a lot to, you know, his work ethic, his drive, his overall IQ and understanding of the game. If you could speak on that and also if he shared like how he's valued his experience at o- OTE this season. Yeah, well, to really start off, I, I would say that when he committed to Overtime Elite, when he signed with Overtime Elite, it was really as his stock was just going up and up. Um, he was relatively unknown, but compared to where he was when he committed, compared to a few months prior, he was a lot more known uh, at that time. And um, yeah, and so, uh, sorry, what was the second part of that question? Yeah, just um, speaking to on his work ethic and drive and understanding of the game and how he's valued his time with the overtime elite this year. Yeah, and so really going into the season, he talked about wanting to get better in transition, wanting to obviously shoot the ball better. And as, as those stats point out, he, he, uh, he lived up to that. He, he improved his shooting. And like I said, I was very impressed by just how much he was looking to shoot the ball and not shying away from it. Uh, that was something that he talked about a lot in my conversations with him was that he wanted mm-hmm. to be a much better shooter. And he knew that that's what, a lot of people are looking at when they're evaluating him as a draft prospect. Can he shoot the ball as a stretch four? And he really honed in on that and improved there. Defensively, he improved, but just with a seven-one wingspan, with his size, he's going to be a beast on the defensive end. Um, right. So he he was just a great defender all year, and he really talking about a guy Matt Buley, who was probably one of the bigger. Um, he was definitely one of the most physical players in the overtime elite program and one of the best front court players. When he went up against Dom, Dom really set the tone and, um, and put up a great performance. So those were the kind of matchups that I was looking for with Dom. How would he fare against a guy like Matt Buley played great? How would he fare against um, other top tier big men? And uh, he performed. So Excellent stuff. Any Anything before we move on to, to Montero, any, any play or any situation or any story in particular that stands out to you about Don Barlow? Yeah. Um, it would have to be, let's see, what was the day of that? I think it was um, February 4th. Uh, he's playing a game against DME Academy at OTE. He was, he lot, he went into that game. I said, he, he goes into each game dialed in this game. He was dialed in. he, put up 13 first quarter points, finished with 27 points, uh, and most impressively, five for five from three. And after that game, I asked him, what, what was it, Dom? Why, how'd, you, how'd you do that tonight? It was his first game that his, his family was in the arena. Um, that That's was awesome. A great story. His mom was there, and, uh, and then he was doing it in the memory of his second grade, his second grade teacher who passed away shortly before that. So uh, that was really one of my favorite Dom stories from the season. He, he looked like he had something to chip on his shoulder on that one. So it sounds like by all accounts that, and, and Nathan, I'm, I'm sure that you're going to want to know this too, that, that, that Dom's a high character guy. Is there anything like kind of off court related that kind of speaks to that, that you could share with us? Um, it's hard to say something in particular. He just, is always a friendly, uh, nice guy off the court. Um, he'll always come up and say hi to you. Um, in my, I wrote a feature on him for, for Zach's blog. I had the time to, to talk to his mom. And, um, and then I talked to his teammate, Jay-Z on Gortman. He said he's one of the hardest workers at OTE. Talked to his coach, Ryan Gomes. They all say the same thing. He is one of the hardest workers at OTE, and he really sets the tone for that program. Excellent. I love hearing it. I love hearing all of that. Dominic, if you're listening, I promise I'm going to, I'm boosting you up my board a little bit, buddy. I'm, already, <laughs> I'm, I'm working on the next edition on my board. I promise when, when he liked that tweet where I gave him a little bit of slack, that was like, all right, this guy's paying attention. I love that. I love when a prospect does yeah. that when, when they, when they try and clap back a little bit in, in the slightest of ways possible, but yet meaningful. So um, I love everything that I've heard about Dominic over time has done an excellent job at filming like the pro day type of stuff, um, getting up close one-on-one with guys in terms of their workouts. All of that YouTube content has been phenomenal for me to be able to go back and watch considering I was for the most part paying attention to a lot of college basketball 
this year, paying attention to the draft. Wasn't always able to catch every overtime elite game live, but YouTube does have everything that you need. Anyone out there listening, if they need to catch up on any film and they want to get to know these guys a little bit one-on-one, go check out all of the YouTube content. John Montero. John Montero. Very divisive point guard prospect in a lot of circles. This guy was viewed as yep. <laughs> lottery level prospect, potentially top 10 talent coming into the season, slid down a lot of draft boards um, over this year. And I won't name any names, but in some boards that I've looked at online, who I know for a fact, these people have been in person at overtime, um, viewing some of these games up close, getting to watch some workouts. If they're, not necessarily bringing John Montero back up their draft boards. That's a little curious to me. So I wasn't able to be there. I've seen a lot of the overseas stuff, Jacob. I am certainly impressed with some of the overseas tape that I've seen of him. Rafael Barlow has had nothing but good things to say about him. The overtime elite tape is, is curious because we talked about the level of competition. I can, I can go and I can point to some highlight clips on YouTube. I'd be like, no other players in the draft potentially <laughs> have as high of highs as Montero does on film, but he also has some of the lowest of lows, unfortunately. And it's, it's interesting to kind of balance the two, especially when he's playing the point guard position, a position of leadership position of, you know, high IQ. He needs to be able to make the right decisions, not just for himself, but for others. So Jacob fair or foul, a lot of the potential draft stock, um, negatives or shortcomings, I should say, that have happened to Montero over the course of this draft cycle. What are your thoughts on him as you've got to see him up close and personal a decent amount of the season? Yeah, he is the biggest enigma in this overtime early <laughs> program. That's a good word. As far as draft stock, um, he's just, he's such a high volume player that it, he, he, let, he scored uh, most total points in overtime elite the first year. Um, he put up if you just if you're just looking at the traditional stats, yeah, you put up big numbers. Um, but there are a lot of questions. The biggest questions that I have are related to the decision making. Um, you see a lot of thirty foot jumpers when instead of getting into the flow of the offense, when you when you do see him really taking on that traditional point guard role and getting into the flow of the offense, he can do a lot. But a lot of the times he just forces some some ill-advised shots um, and just tries to do too much. Um, so the biggest question marks that I have are related to um, to that decision making, and that's why personally I'd like to see him. I know he's he's slipped in some boards out of the first round. I'd like to see him at the end of the first round go to a team that is a contender that has a veteran point guard that he can learn under. Um, I was thinking I was talking to. Uh, Dash Sperling, who runs the OTE scouting account, um, and he was saying the Miami Heat, and I, I would agree with mm. you, to see him uh, work with a guy like Kyle Lowry. That would uh, that would really be nice to see. And um, but yeah, he he's very on, on the defensive end. I was I, I might have been more impressed with him uh, for sure on the defensive end than the offensive end at, at times. Um, Talk to me about that because like it's not. He he's like he's listed at six two, around between six two and six three. He's not not the biggest of guys, about one hundred seventy five pounds is what he's listed at. And you can see that on the film, right? But talk about his competitiveness on that end, because just looking at him, his stature could scare some people away um, from him on the defensive end. But some of these guys, I mean, we've seen like Kennedy Chandler make mm-hmm. a good impact on the defensive end of Tennessee. Ty Ty Washington can hold his own um, when he played at Kentucky. Talk to me about Montero's defense a little bit. Yeah, and I he came into this league with a lot more experience than a lot of these other guys, and so I think that really shows on the defensive end. His court instincts are um, a lot higher than some of the other players in that league. Um, if you look at his steal numbers, the, he gets a lot of steals, and yep. he'll, he'll get a, he'll make a lot of plays um, in the fast break off of steals, and that's really when he shines the most. Is um, really just pressing guys at half court or even even uh, in the backcourt and, and then uh, getting some steals. Um, he struggled at times against larger, larger opponents. Um, I know in some of the, um, some of the interleague games, uh, both Amen and Asar Thompson had, had their, their way with uh, against John Montero, but as, as they did against a lot of players in the, in yeah. the program. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, but yeah, I, I was impressed by him on the defensive end. Um, and yeah, on the offensive end, there's a lot to be, there's a lot, uh, there that, that is impressive. It's just a matter of honing it in and, um, getting that decision-making on par. As far as, and by the way, I'll, I'll read off some of the stats really quick, then I'll touch on one aspect. Uh, per 36, 22 points per game, six assists, nine and a half rebounds. That, that's a great number of the points to athletic talent, the nine and a half rebounds. Um, three and a half turnovers, as you mentioned, we would like to see that cut down just a little bit, but not as far away from the two to one assistant ratio um, as you might have expected. So there, there, there is some, some silver linings to be had there. 50.3% on twos, 27.5% on threes, 77.7% 7 from the free throw line and 4.4 steals per 36 minutes. That, as you said, Jacob, that's a really impressive number yeah. um, for, for a point guard. So the, obviously those things stand out, but the 27.5% from three, that to me is also one of the biggest question marks with scouts. So before I touch on one last aspect, before I kick it over to Steven, that's, that's a more physical aspect, the shooting. Do you buy the shot? Do you think that percentage was just lower because of the types of shots that he himself was choosing to take? Or do you think there's anything maybe mechanically or anything else you might have noticed about the shot that would have led to a lower percentage than we think we know he's capable of? I think the shot is there. Um, I'm not saying he's, he's not Steph Curry. He's not, he's not <laughs> knocked down everything from three, but when it's a good shot, there's a good chance he's going to knock it down. I think that percentage is likely a result of the poor shot selection. Um, I think that you just saw a lot of ill-advised shots, like I said, and that really bumped down those numbers. So I think the shot is there. It's just a matter of um, finding the right time to shoot it. The last thing I'll ask you about as far as um, a, a physical trait would be, and, and this is important for point guards of his size to have, because a lot of these, these average size to potentially below average size point guards, unless they have, some sort of elite physical trait. They generally are not looked at as potential starters in the NBA, but Montero does have, and Steven knows I do not throw this word around a lot, Correct. does have elite speed on the basketball court. Um, and, and that's something it can stand out on tape, but that's usually something that stands out even more in person was with Jacob, in your opinion, was his speed definitely a game changer compared to others in, in the overtime elite program? I would say so. It's hard because he is teammates with a guy, Jay-Z on Gortman, who has absurd speed. Um, watching those two in the backcourt together, it's hard to find a backcourt that that can match their speed. I, I don't think there was one all season. Um, yeah, the speed is there. Um, and that can also play into some of those, those poor decisions because sometimes he just needs to slow his game down. Yep. But when he needs to speed it up, he can speed it up. And, and it's fun to watch. Go ahead, Steven, jump on in, buddy. Yeah, so I want to lead off first with that you spoke to how polished he was coming into the overtime elite. And if you go back and look at anything that he's done prior to the to the overtime elite, which is where I think that he's getting a, you know, a fair amount of, you know, criticism on his game because, you know, he was kind of the big fish in the pond here and he played like it, which is a good thing, right? Like it would have been one thing if he came to the OTE and looked a little lost, but he looked like he had professional experience, you know, playing with Grand Canaria. He did good in World Series with other, you know, great talent amongst his peer level, was the MVP at Basketball Without Borders. And then fast forwarding to the Hoop Summit, he looked really good for the world team there. So was was kind of the inefficiencies and the the speeding up. Do you think that that had to do anything with like the individualized training that they were trying to give him to get him ready for the NBA and adjusting to a new role? Or was it kind of a lot of the same thing, but just with like a different level of talent? I think that could be somewhat of a factor. Um, something that I would just, this is kind of just hypothesizing, but sure. uh, being with his reputation coming in, being one of the older guys, it's not like he has someone, another player, another teammate to look up to within the overtime program. So there isn't really a guy that can go to him and, and say, Hey, slow it down. Like he, he is that big fish in the overtime program. So I think you saw a lot of him trying to put everything on his shoulders. And sometimes that was not the right option, but um, the, the talent is there in my opinion. It's just a matter of, of 
putting him in the right system and, and putting him next to the right guys that can help him develop. Sure. And you're, you're speaking to him as a teammate. And that's one aspect that I want to kind of focus on with this question. You know, we, we talked about the gameplay stuff, but as a person and a competitor, right, like watching him interact with his coaches and his teammates or even in practices where there wasn't necessarily a crowd of people there to watch him. Is there anything that you can kind of speak on to kind of help us gain a better understanding of how he prepares himself to compete in games? He loves the game. He loves the game. And I know you could say that about a lot of guys, but sure. when you talk to John, it's all basketball. He's going to talk to you. If you ask him a question, it's, it's going to be about basketball, no matter what you ask him. Um, and then something that I can point to, uh, I think it was in, in January, they had a game against uh, Moravian Prep and he was, he was inactive for that game. Um, I know that he was, he was injured during that time. Um, but post game, you just see him in a sweater and jeans, putting up shots alone in the gym. Um, and <laughs> you could just tell that he, he wanted to be out there. He really wanted to be out there. Um, but he, he wasn't able to. And, uh, when he came back, he, he did the same things that he, he's been doing all season. So, um, th- I know that, uh, there has been a lot of criticism of John and um, he did come in with sky high expectations that he may not have lived up to, but the guy loves the game and the talent is there in my opinion. And one last question, or really I'm going to ask your opinion on something. Nathan doesn't know this is coming. So this is going to be a surprise to both of you. And then I'll hand it back. over. Sometimes to I throw curveballs. Sometimes Steven throws curveballs. <laughs> it's just part of the show. You got to just kind of put up with it sometimes, but Jacob, one kind of player comparison that I have tried to just like, suppressed for such a long time while watching him play um I, I can't shake it he gives me so many of the same vibes of of a young Tony Parker like do you see that similar style of play with a Jean Montero because I mean a guy who eventually did grow into becoming a good three-point shooter um but wasn't afraid to take the shot at a young age did play really fast, did have to learn how to slow down, was a great teammate, did have great world success before he came into the NBA. Do you see a little bit of those similarities or am I a little crazy here? I don't think you're crazy. I, I think that there are some similarities, definitely. Um, I think that the Tony Parker comparison is a good one. Um, All right. Another comparison that I heard was uh, Terry Rozier. Um, I see some, some comparisons there, um, but yeah, it's, it's hard to pinpoint. I, I've never been a huge fan of comparison, so it's hard to pinpoint an exact player that he plays like, but I, I don't hate the Tony Park, Parker comparison. That, that That's a good one. I appreciate that, man. That makes me feel better. Nathan, he, he's all yours. He, he made me feel happy. So there you go. <laughs> no, I, I, I love a lot of the insight that, that Jacob has given us on these guys. because it, It's important to hear those nuggets and those tidbits and, and those stories. And we'd be remiss if we didn't ask about, I, I'm, I'm curious to hear if you do have any, any thoughts on um, Coke yet before we get into the, the Thompson twins, because he is another 2022 yeah. eligible draft prospect. Yeah. Cook, it's hard because he missed a majority of the season yeah. um, with it, with a, I think it was a stress fact, fracture in his foot. Um, honestly, before the injury, I was not very impressed with him to be frank. Um I know that going in, he was one of the, the top draft prospects in 2022 among those overtime elite players. And I frankly was, I didn't see it, um, but he missed uh, something like four months. Um, he missed a good chunk of the season. And when he came back, I saw it. Um, he, he is a, he, he's a, he's a great athlete. Um, and I always saw that the athleticism, um, but when he came back, you could really see he looked polished. He looked like he could play um, with some of the top players in the world. And um, it was, I know when he did return, he, he looked hesitant in that first game, but the second game back, he played great. And he, he was shooting from three, he was blocking shots. He can be that kind of player that, um, and I think that a lot of, a lot of the coaches at Overtime Elite see it, um, that he can be a, an NBA player. Um, and be a very good one. So I hate, and I mean, I hate talking about another draft before I'm finished with the one that we're in. However, 
yeah, I can't, I can't let you go and not ask you about special occasion. Um, we have to, th- this really is a special, it, it's only because we got a reporter who's been on the scenes like Jacob, who I, I have to ask the questions. Otherwise I probably would have just focused on the 2022 guys, but the Thompson twins, Jacob, got you saw talk. a lot of them. You saw plenty of them. Talk to me about Eamon and Asair who g- give me a little bit of a breakdown in each of their games. Who, who, Who's the better prospect between the two? Because there, there's legitimate debate online about who might be the better one of the two, or, or you think they're on basically the same playing field. Or or if you could, J- Jacob, just real quick, if you think it's a tie, like what aspects of the game do you think? I'm not going to get that with a tie. Okay, okay. I love, All right. I love it. Let's get it. Get it. Talk to us about the Thompson Twins. First off, you need to see these guys play in person. They are – a show they can play and they are just the, some of the greatest athletes I've ever seen um, in my life. And uh, yeah, they are, I said it in my, uh, in my story on the, on the program, they're the, the crown jewel of this overtime elite program. Um, starting with, I, I know that a lot of people have a men over a SAR personally, I give the edge to a SAR. Um, okay. One Asar beat his twin in the OTE finals. So that is the, I know it's a team game, all that. You got to give him some credit there. One's got the trophy and one doesn't, man. That's bragging. Head to head matters. Head to head matters. Uh, oh, the first ever overtime elite finals MVP, Asar Thompson. Um, so he, he does earn some, some credit there. But when you're really looking at their games, um, it's hard to tell the difference. Um, the biggest thing is the shooting. And I know that's the biggest thing that, um, that both of them have are criticized for is, is their shooting. Um, neither of them are, are really knockdown shooters by any means. Um, the mid range is getting better. The biggest problem in a men's game is the free throw shooting. Um, I don't have the numbers pulled up, but throughout the season, he struggled at the free throw line. I don't know if it was a mechanics issue or just a mental issue, but Asar didn't have as much of a problem with the free throw line. A men did. And then just shooting the ball overall, you saw Asar just be a, a opt to shoot a little bit more. You saw a men kind of shy away from the shooting, which it's hard to blame him when he can drive to the rim like he does. But uh, I know that some people, I, I was talking with, uh, with Dash um, over at OT scouting about this and, I know a lot of people say that a man is the better athlete. It's splitting hairs. They are both freak athletes that are, they're, they're identical twins. They, it's hard to really tell um, who is the better athlete. You might give a man a slight nod, but um, overall I, I give, I say Asar is the, is the better of the two right now. I mean, I know we're talking about those guys for the 2023 draft, but there, there was at one point slight optimism that they might've been eligible for the 2022 mm-hmm. draft. So not, not that I'm making you like magically whip out a big board or something like that in front of you, but like, do, do you think if they were 2022 eligible, like in, in this class, given the prospects that they would still be like top 10 type guys, like they're being viewed as next year? I think so. Yeah. And I, I think that a lot of people, so these guys are the real deal, huh? Yeah, there's the argument that this 2023 draft is uh, more top heavy than 2022. I it's pretty close. <laughs> you got some really, really good guys at the top of uh, top of this 2022 draft, but I do think that it's tough because it's two guys. So yeah, two spots in that top ten. <laughs> I think that, uh, at least one of them would be a top ten guy in this year's draft, and it, I, I think you for you'd be a sar. For me, so both, be- so both pushing pushing lottery. Would you say that that's more, oh, more realistic? They okay. are, both, yeah, they are both lottery picks. Oh but. my god, dude, we have so much to look forward to in twenty twenty. Well, Shaden like, Sharp didn't play a game, came in and was, and now is largely considered a top five prospect, like easily, like could go number one if a team gets crazy. But yeah, I mean, I don't think that that's too far out, out of out of hand at all to say that both of those guys could be lottery picks. Yeah, and and much I know that. The, the past few months, there have been a lot of talk about, are, the, are they 2022 draft eligible? I don't know if there was a path for them to be 2022 draft eligible. I, I would assume there was, um, but they, they are currently in, taking classes at Overtime Elite, will be graduating in the spring, so they will not be 
going to the 2022 NBA draft, you, you can put those rumors to rest. <laughs> Just makes next year all the more fun to evaluate, Nathan. Yeah, really. 2023, holy smokes. We got so much talent <laughs> in, in that draft. But, Stephen, come on. We got to be focused on the task at hand. There's still two months left of work to do. You're the one that steered it this way. I know. This well, I, I, it was gotta fun, give, You got to give the people what they want. If we had Jacob Absolutely. on talking over time elite, we didn't ask about the Thompson twins. I think somebody would be – Can we get quick hits story. on Cunningham? Quick hits on Cunningham? Yeah, like Cunningham. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen Cunningham play a ton. I, I'm not going to say I'm an expert um, on, on his game. Um, I asked Dom. I was texting with Dom because I know um, – Obviously, Dom was the first player out of New Jersey to join Overtime Elite. Nas is the second. And so I know that uh, I texted Dom. He's like, yeah, that's my guy. Um, Dom said he's a three-level three level scorer, crazy athleticism, does a bit of everything, can handle and shoot at a high level, can defend multiple positions. He's really a special talent. That's the word of Dom Barlow. Um, he's the number one player in the country. Uh, like, Well, that's where ESPN had him, number one prospect on their – board for his class right yeah so i i can't say that i've seen him play um i i haven't really i don't know his game very well but he's from everything that i'm hearing he's a special talent and i don't know how the teams are going to be set up at overtime elite next season but to see him play with or against the thompson twins that's going to be fun oh man that i mean yeah. that just speaks to the to the credibility and the reputation that the overtime elite has built throughout their inaugural season. The fact that now they're creating even more pathways for players to be able to not only get early experience against top level competition, but now they're creating these avenues to where you can make money and still go to school. Like you're, you're being able to be a professional in your craft and still get, you know, all the opportunities that you need to, to succeed at whatever level you so happen to want to play at. Did you, did you think that would happen? that fast Jacob for like overtime elite to like all of a sudden in their second year, we're talking, we're, we're not just talking about like another guy. Like I, I know John Montero was a projected like lottery pick, but we're talking about like the number one high school player in the country, like making a choice like that. Like did, did anybody think that could happen that soon? So with NIL now in place, what I thought was going to happen was they were just going to keep pushing the NCAA to allow these guys to be NCAA eligible. Um, the way I saw it, like I said earlier, when they're having to compete against the G League and other college programs, that's tough. That's really tough. Yeah. But when when a guy like Nas Cunningham can make the money he can off NIL, he doesn't need that $100,000 salary. He's going to make a ton of money, and then he can go play a year or two at Overtime Elite and go to a college program. So um, I didn't think – I. I in talks with some of the people at Overtime Elite, they they were telling me something's coming. They're going to be landing some guys, but the number one player in the country, I, I can't say I saw that coming. That's that's a great point about the off the court money too. I mean, with the program being in Atlanta, I mean that's that's a sports marketing hotbed. It's a hip hop marketing hotbed. Yeah, there, there's going to be a lot of opportunities for talking about TNT, all like everything. Oh yeah, like basketball in, in Atlanta is a big deal. I, I think the, the sky's the limit for the overtime program at this point. And honestly, Jacob, I'm really glad that we had you on because I, I feel a lot yes. better about it now. This was Absolutely. this was definitely needed on my end. So, and certainly for, for my audience out there listening, um, I, I definitely want them to make sure that they thank you for, for coming on the podcast and giving us all the content that you did. Jacob, please, please enlighten my audience where they can find you on social media and where they can find all of your work because – I think it's always important to shout out guys who they might not be doing this as their quote unquote full-time job. Steven and I certainly aren't, but when, when we are able to be recognized and our, and our hard work pays off, I want to be able to pay that forward and also make sure that anybody out there like yourself, you're also being recognized because every story you've done that I've, that I've re uh, read for Zag's blog, absolutely phenomenal stuff. Man. Premium content. Yes. And any closing comments too, that you have that we didn't get a chance to cover yet. Yeah. Just, just thank you guys so much for having me on. Um, I always love talking to talking basketball, talking about overtime elite. Um, you can find my work. Uh, my Twitter is at Jacob Polachek. Um, you can find my work on zagsblog.com, uh, the poor report.com, made hoops.com. And if you're a lot, if you're a business of law fan, head over to law.com. <laughs> you can get some of that, uh, some of that law firm news. 
Awesome. Excellent stuff. Steven, Thank you ahead. very much. Jacob. Go ahead. Plug yourself, buddy. Yeah. And Jacob, just uh, thank you so much for coming on here, enlightening us. Give us a lot of insight because, you know, not just providing lip service here. Nathan and I both were like, we can't wait to get Jacob on the show because we need to, as obviously as it is for like a new program, like the Overtime Elite, like we need help too in learning how we need to, you know, digest and understand how to evaluate these players. So thank you so much for all the work that you're doing and coming onto the show. But for the audience, you know, want to continue to engage with me, you can find me on Twitter. That's where I'm most active at Stephen G Hoops. That's Stephen with the PH, the letter G, and then Hoops. Uh, you can find my written work um, as well as Nathan's on noceilingsmba.com. I just had my weekend warrior piece debut actually on Nathan's day on Mondays, you know, because of stuff that's been going on. So it was cool to have the weekend warrior debut on a Monday. And I just wrote about Walker Kessler Ranger. So that was a fun little theme to talk about Auburn big man, Walker Kessler. Um, got some more written work coming down the pipe. And obviously, Nathan, you and I have some more fun shows. We just did yesterday at the time of this recording. Yesterday, we started walking through my big board prospects 60 through 45. We're going to continue to do that. And then eventually, Nathan is going to bleed over into your board. Certainly excellent content that we've done already plenty more in the pipeline you mentioned the writing over at no ceilings mba.com steven if anyone out there isn't subscribed please go ahead and do so i gotta write a don barlow piece now I, that's that's Have one to. we haven't done on those still and now now i gotta do it i i feel really compelled to, to do so so definitely make sure you're subscribed for whenever that drops don't got a day in, in mind yet but promise it's coming um, make sure you're following me on Twitter at Draft Deeper and make sure you subscribe to the Draft Deeper podcast wherever you get your podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube. Yes, definitely stay tuned. Check out that Big Board podcast. If you haven't already, Stephen Gillespie, 60 to 45 on his Big Board. Last show this week, we're bringing out the big guns. Chuck, yes. from Chuck and Darts is coming on. I said this when we were finished recording yesterday. You already know. It's going to be a two, two and a half hour podcast. Better get your popcorn. Better get a nice fancy bottle of wine. Again. Just just ready to relax and hear, hear premium basketball conversation. Chuck hit me with the lineup of guys he wants to talk about yesterday. And I can assure we're, we're going to have some debate. I can promise you we're going to have some debate. So definitely make sure you're staying tuned to the podcast feed. Everything we're doing at No Ceilings NBA on Twitter. But for now, Thank you all for listening. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week. Later, guys.